So, uh, but today I want to go in a slightly different direction because last class I gave a shout out to conservatives and, and now I'm going to push up against some of the thinking of many of you who are conservatives. And I'm going to talk about some things that uh, will be, in the end, well, they're probably, for some of you, they'll be a little bit uncomfortable. For most of you, they'll just be, it's just completely new information. And I'll try to do it in a way that is thoughtful and recognizing that, um, that you know, many of you, most of you, don't think a lot about history and in part, you know, because you most of you, you're young, right? In history, when you start to, as you start to get older and experience historical factors and forces in different ways, history becomes much more interesting. Um, so, uh, let me just say a couple things. I, I want to, we're going to talk about Latin America today, and a couple things are in the news. And if you're paying attention, you've heard Venezuela is in the news. And even if you're hardly paying attention, you can hardly walk past a screen or see a headline where you don't see something uh, that we're saying about Venezuela and about the dictatorship of the Maduro government in Venezuela, which is what, you know, we're, we're the, the administration and so many Americans are talking about, um, and sanctions against Venezuela. And the, and the president, Nicolas Maduro, is accusing the U.S. of just really preparing to invade so, you know, they're kind of shoring up their defenses and, and then, you know, we're coming back and, you know, now we're kind of trying to get the Venezuelan army to stage a coup d'etat against the government. And so this is, this is a big issue. This is actually a, a, actually a pretty serious issue, y'all. And certainly it is in Colombia and where I'll be because there are a million uh, Venezuelans, Venezuelans in Colombia right now. And so... Um, the other thing that jumps up is the, the migrant uh, caravans, as we've been calling them, and the number of immigrants coming up from Latin America, mostly Central America, uh, who are on the borders and who are really um, coming up through Central America, all through Mexico, and now trying to get, to get into the United States um, and to gain asylum to get in the U.S. And so this is a big issue. This is part of the President, President Trump's reason and some folks in the administration reason of building a wall and just one thing after another. And so you, you know, you, most of us really, A, don't know anything about Venezuela, because why would we, right? I mean, it's a, you know, um, well, now you know it's in Latin America. If I had asked most, you know, half of you wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have known that. And that's not a diss really to you. It's just that that's not what we pay attention to. And most of us really don't understand this. What, but what we know is there are a bunch of people coming up from um, different areas in Latin America uh, and who are trying to get into the United States. And so that creates a certain amount of fear. And, and so I want to talk a little about, a, a bit about some of the factors and forces that lead to that. And it's mostly going to be uh, me talking today. But, you know, so here, just to see this as a map. So, he, you know, here, this is Venezuela here, just so you're aware. And most of the people coming up in who are part of the migrant caravan, you know, started in Honduras and in Guatemala. So this is Honduras, that's Guatemala, and went all the way up through Mexico. I mean, it's pretty serious. You know, uh, walking, trains, hiring trucks, buses, a lot of walking. And uh, some folks coming from other areas, but mostly the, it's, it, most of the people are from those two countries, just so you have a, a sense of what that means. Um, but for the moment, I just want to talk about I've, I've already talked about this, but I want to just do this in more directly because I want you to understand when we talk about L Hispanics and Latinos and, and, and so on, like who we're talking about. So I just need a few, maybe like six people who could volunteer. Are there any, who could come up? Who's, who identifies as Hispanic or Latino? Who could come up? So one, where, where are you from? Venezuela. Oh, Venezuela. Okay, cool. Where are you from? Where are you from? Puerto are you Puerto Rican? Oh, you're from there? Okay, why don't you come? I'll take you. Who else? Who else? Could, who's, any Dominicans? Wait. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay, how about you? Wait, you're Dominican, right? All right. Dominican. Yeah. Okay, move in. All right. Who else? Any Brazilians? Who's from Brazil? 
Anybody from Brazil? <laughs> Nobody? Anybody half Brazilian? Who, who, who else? Who else is Latino? I just want to play off it a little bit. I need a few more volunteers just to kick it out. Anybody? Who's bla- who is Latino who's black? Who's dark-skinned Latino? Dude, are you dark Are you Latino? No, you're not. All right. I know you're not because you do. Wait, are you dark Are you Latina? Okay, how about you? Come on. Oh, perfect, man. All right. What's that? Okay. Okay, you ready? You take that. Okay, so you're from, where are you from Venezuela? Yeah. Where from? From Caracas? See, the chances of you being from Caracas would be really high. Are you from, were you born there? Do you currently, does your family live there? Uh, Wait, hang on, speak in the mic. Yeah. So my entire family lives there, uh, but not my immediate family. We were one of those people that immigrated right uh, when the coup, actually a little bit after the first coup began. Uh, so I guess we're in the lucky batch. Okay. But the rest, my, all my grandparents, all my aunts, they still live in Venezuela. Wow, yeah, that's intense. All right. And like, you know, because they're going through something that's really is unprecedented for many, many years. Okay, and what's your name again? Sophie. Sophie? Okay. No. You finally get up here. All right, where's your, where are you from? I'm Dominican and I'm Puerto Rican. My family is from an, a town called Ibonito from Puerto Rico. And then my Dominican side is from Cotuí. Where from? Where at? Cotuí. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And what's your name? Chanelli. Chanelli. All right. I'm Paola. I'm Puerto Rican, and yeah. And where where is your family in Puerto Rico now? Yeah, um, I have grandparents, aunts, and uncles who live in Caguas in Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, my name is Jasmine. Jasmine, I go by Jazz. Um, my parent, uh, my immediate family, my mom and her all her sisters and brothers were from Panama. Uh, I don't remember the. Uh, a city, yeah. but yeah. Okay, so here's the thing, right? So notice the differences here, right? Like, the, we, 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 again, I want to say this. This is, I, I mentioned this in an earlier class, but I just want to lay it out. Hispanic is not a racial category, or it, it is not even really, we don't t- refer to, it's an ancestry category of sorts, but ancestry is race, it's sociology, it's culture, it's many things all put together. But what you'll see a lot of times like you're applying to something like Penn State, it's like, you know, are you white, Caucasian, are you black, African, are you Hispanic, are you Asian, are you South Asian, or whatever, right? But we throw Hispanic in there, but the truth is, um, it's, not, it's not the same category. So here, first off, the, so La, the Americas are populated by people of Asian ancestry, okay? So we talked about that, Asian ancestry, which is why you see, like if I look at, like, look at your, look at her eyes. Look at, so, wait, what is it? So, so, no, wait, can you, yeah, just get, get a shot of her eyes. See, like, you can just see the, the, this sort of, do you have Indian blood? So if we do an ancestry test, you definitely have Indian blood. I can see it in your chin, too. What's, I told you I wanted one. After you wanted one? Yeah. So we'll hook Give you up. It's $50. Give me, Give me 50 bucks. All right. All right, man, let me see what I can do. All right. And you as well. Look at, look, at, look at like her eyes. And can you, you can see this is Indian blood. Okay, so now we have Asian blood. So we do an ancestry test. We see that even with your eyes, but it's going to be a little different. And you a little bit, but it's different with you. Yeah. So, okay, so that's the first thing. Then we have African ancestry in the Americas. And so people have the idea that the slave trade involved the United States. And of course it did. But only about a half million Africans who were taken out of Africa ended up in North America in what is the United States because in North America was a reproducing slave population. The vast majority of slaves went to Central America and South America. So, you know, Jamaica, Haiti, Trinidad, these are all slave ports. These are fundamentally slave ports. So the the Dominican Republic, right? So you have half the Dominican Republic was a slave republic run by the French and the other half run by the Spanish. And so this is why you have, you're from Panama. So lots, Panama as well was a slave port. So what's your name again? Jasmine. Jasmine. So Jasmine is Negrita, 
right? And so she's black, right? This is her African ancestry. But also, like, man, I'm looking at, you definitely have Indian blood for sure. Like I can see in your, up, up here. But I don't know about white, do you have white in your family? No, my mom says that um, we're from uh, Barbados a yeah. little bit, but. That's yeah, so Barbados was a slave port also, right? So a lot of back and forth. So you have black Latino, you have, and then you're, and then, then we have, um, and then we have all of, of course, the European conquest. So your family is mostly white, European. Um, Wait, hang on. Yeah. So that's, that's a little bit interesting. My dad's from the Canary Islands. Okay. And then my mom is from... The Canary Ireland. Islands is a Spanish-owned colony. Okay, go Correct. ahead. Uh, and then my mom is from all the European Caucasian areas. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you look in Latin America, you see that... Generally speaking, and this is what we're going to talk about today, it's the, the, the Americans were, were, it was a territory under conquest from the Europeans, including the Spanish and the Portuguese. So this is why, you know, Brazil, for example, is not technically speaking Hispanic. Hispanic means that you draw your ancestry from, Spa from Spain. And Brazilians, in the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Pope divided South America up into Brazil, which went to Portugal, and the rest of it, which went to Spain. And so in Portugal, you speak Portuguese. You don't speak Spanish. And so Port Brazilians are not Hispanics, but they are Latinos. And so because it's all part of Latin America. And so, but it's, a, it's an area under conquest. So this means white people, right? Like you're, you know, this is white people, right? The conquest, like more, this is part, you have more white blood. So like our blood, Con con the conquistadors over the, the, what you have is more Indian blood, but you also have you, you definitely also have black and white blood. You let you more. I don't know. It's really interesting. It's really, oh, it'd be cool to take an ancestry test. My dad's like really dark, but I'm not. Yeah. And my mom's like really really light, so I just. Can't so you get that. Light. And how about your family? Um, my dad, he's really dark skinned My grandfather's really dark skinned My grandma is white. She's blonde hair, blue eyes. Yeah. And then there's me. Yeah. And then there's you. <laughs> yeah. And you're in between, right? You yeah. have all. So you see like how if we st try to identify a race group, and you think about Latinos or you think about Hispanics, you can't think about a p particular physiological characteristics, right? So because in like in, in you. Got it? Is that cool? So think about as we're moving forward, think about that, that this is like a, a conquest thing. All right, cool. That's it, man. It was just really that. I just wanted to rock it. And I want to talk about Venezuela at some point with you all. Thanks, you all. Appreciate it. Okay, so now. Okay, so here we go. Um, this, the, here's the, the, the couple things we start up. First, um, people came to the Americas in search of land and resources, fundamentally, okay? In search of land and resources. And in that quest for land and resources, they A, had to create, we'll talk about this next class a little more, so I don't really want, I don't want to dig into it too much, but it was all about the, whatever was here was going to be taken by the people who came and they had bigger guns and they had more desire for what it was and they brought diseases with them and they just had all of the tools that were needed to wipe out the people who were living in the land in the americas okay that this land right here this is stolen land all of the land from Canada down to the southern tip of Chile is all stolen land. I mean, it's taken from somebody else. And you have to really understand the power of that story. And you can have the idea. So it's like, well, this is the story of life. Some people take, they win here, they lose there. People take, they fight wars. They take it what other people have. People give up what they have. I mean, this is the nature of human history. It, yeah, it is the nature of human history to a degree. But it's also really pretty interesting interesting that it's convenient if you're the group that's on top to hold on to that particular story. So come along to, we're going to move up to the 20th. So, so we got, we have like 400 years of people 
the people of European ancestry using their power and their might to just take control of the land and get rich off of it and send the riches back to the home country. So this is it. You got 400 years of this. I mean, and it's complex, obviously, right? I mean, I, I was a Latin American, uh, I, a Latin Americanist in all of my doctoral work. So it's like, trust me when I say it, it's complex. But then in the 20th century, we start this battle with the, after World War II, with the Soviet Union. And the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic is what that stands for. And the, here is Russia, the Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union was not just Russia, which is one country here, but also all the other countries that came under their domain. And the rest of the world being the United States and its Western allies. So we have Western Europe, we have here. The Americas were ours, was the United States. And then, of course, you know, in different areas of Asia. And then the world lined up, either with the Russians or with the Americans, Fundamentally, okay? And then we fought it out. And we fought out the war in the Americas because we, that was our land. And this is really important. So here, oh God, I wish I, I wish I could, I wish I could tell you, hang on, I'm going to tell you the story in a way, okay? So when I was your age, in, in 1980, I was 20 years old. And this story hit the news. Four church women were killed. They were nuns. They went down to Central America and, uh, and to El Salvador in particular. And they were going down to do, they were marinal nuns. So they really were working with the poorest of the poor in El Salvador. In El Salvador, what you need to know about the Americas at this point in time is this immense inequality. It's immense inequality. So, a, such a large percentage of the population throughout Latin America living on subsistence economies. Like really barely getting by. So when you think about, when you have an image of people who are really, really poor in the world, you got to think of an extremely large percentage of people. At the same time, you got to think about the ruling elite who trace their ties back to Spain and Europe and then increasingly the United States, who hold the power, who hold the resources, who just hold control of everything. And then you have the large numbers of really poor people. These women right here were going down to work with the poorest of the poor. They were identified by the El Salvadoran government as being communist. And they, there were thousands upon thousands of church people, I later came to find out, were being killed by their governments. Priests, nuns, lay clergy, including people from the U.S. They were Americans. They were killed. Nothing happened. But it hit, a, it hit the news. You know, no one was caught. Um... Then the bishop of El Salvador was killed right after he gave mass. And he gave the mass and he said, please, as the leader of the church in El Salvador, I beg of you, stop the violence. Stop the violence. So I'm going to tell you what some of that violence is in a minute. But I... in my 20-year-old self, was really interested in religion. And I started just looking around to say, why are we killing bishops? And why are we killing nuns in these countries? Right? And who's killing them? And I discovered this idea of liberation theology. And liberation theology was a theology put together by Christians, drawn up by Christians who said, We've been reading the Bible. And actually in the Bible, what Jesus said is that you should help the poor. And what Jesus said is that the land is for everybody. But when we look around, what we see as Christians, so these are priests, lay clergy, nuns, bishops, cardinals, etc. When we look around, what we see is just an immense amount of poverty 
and a lot of violence. And, and when poor people stand up for their rights, either as trade unionists or just to speak about poverty in any way and the things that they're experiencing, they get hammered by the militaries of these countries and the governments of these countries. And there's so much repression. And liberation theologians were very quickly identified as communists because what they said was Jesus truly was a communist. Because what Jesus said was bring people together, poor people together, all people, and help one another, and certainly feed the poor and rich people who are controlling 90% of the resources in our land. Well, other people are going hungry. Infant mortality in El Salvador in the 60s and 70s was like 250, meaning that one out of four children die before they reach the age of one. I mean, just terrible conditions. And so these religious people said Jesus was a communist. It's pretty clear if you read the Bible that Jesus would not support the rich people who are killing the poor people, that Jesus would support the poor people who are standing up for their rights. There's no way Jesus would support the rich. And so I got really interested in this liberation theology because I said, wow, that's a fascinating movement. And it leads the governments to kill thousands upon thousands of church workers, like people who are really just Christians. And you say, oh my God, what is that? So then I started to look around even further. And what I discovered changed my life completely. Changed my life. Because I started out as a 20-year-old who wasn't thinking much about politics and government and foreign policy, like many of you, man. So many of you, right? Just, you're not thinking about it. You're not thinking about it, right? It doesn't matter to you, right? So I'm you. What's your name? Gage, I'm Gage sitting in my classes just thinking like, I don't care. I'm not engaged whenever we talk about these issues. It's just not interesting to me. Why? Because I didn't know anybody. It didn't connect me in any way. But then I found out one really interesting thing. That the money that was being given to all of these countries who are using the money to buy weapons from us to kill their own people was from the United States. So they, that we were actually funding all of the violence against poor people and against Christians. So these women right here were killed by a battalion in El Salvador that was trained in the United States. They were killed with weapons that were given to the government of El Salvador by the United States. And we trained them so that the military in El Salvador would stop communism, which meant stopping people like them, which, meant, which is why nobody was ever tried for their murders. This is the United States. So now imagine that I'm you all, right? Bro, what's your name? What is it? Trevor. So imagine I'm Trevor or I'm Gage, and I'm sitting in a class, and I'm just having this sense that, hey, the United States, it's cool. Like, it's cool, right? We do good work for people. Like, if we're trying to kick Maduro out in Venezuela, he must be a bad guy. If we're calling him a dictator, then he must be a bad guy, right? If we're, like, against the Iranians or we're against whoever it is, they must be really, really bad. And so imagine that I'm just assuming that to be true. And imagine that day when I first discovered that, wait a minute, hang on. Actually, it's the, it, I'm seeing it's the opposite. That, that we, the United States, is paying for the weapons to kill innocent people. I'm, in my life, I just say, wait, hang on a second. That can't be true, right? So then I discover, I keep digging. And the more I dig, the more I discover that, in fact, it very much appears to be the case that the United States is behind all of this killing in these countries, in Latin America. And so I'm 20 years old, and I'm saying, oh, shit. Like, the world that I thought was true is not true. And then what does that mean for me as a human being, right? Are you an American citizen? So what's your name? Brooke. Brooke? So Brooke. So what's it mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm you, and I'm asking myself, so Brooke here, what's it mean that I'm paying taxes 
to buy weapons that are being used to kill people like that. And no one in my government is going to do anything about it. In fact, they're going to cover it up. Like, what does that mean, right? So if you ask yourself that question, right? So the people, you know, I was at the uh, Penn State wrestling match the other day on Sunday because I was at Rec Hall and someone had a free ticket. So I just ran into the wrestling match. for I'd never been to a wrestling match. And so I said, I'll, I'll spend half hour and check this out. And at the start of the wrestling match, they sing, they do the Star Spangled Banner, right? Someone sang the national anthem, right? And so I got to stand up because everyone stands up. So I got to stand up, right? You know, how it is. Now I got to stand up knowing that, wait a minute, hang on. You know, Gage or Trevor or Brooke, you just stand up, right? Because it's like, that's what you do, right? You put your hand on your heart and you just look at the flag, But I got to stand up knowing that the flag also behind that flag, all the good stuff is also all the bad stuff, like the murdering and killing of thousands upon thousands of innocent people, which may mean nothing to you. Like if your little, if your father wasn't killed by the military in El Salvador, that doesn't really mean anything. But do do you have a father? Do you like your father? Is he a nice guy? So imagine your father is pulled out of his house this weekend and killed, and his body ends up on the street. And you think, who the hell did that? And then you find out that actually it was the Canadians that did that, and they paid for that to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it, and we're beholden to the Canadians, and then that's just how life is. And then they're going to do it again. And if you speak out, they'll come after you. And one after another. And eventually you're going to feel some kind of way about the Canadians, right? And imagine that's happening all around you. And all your father was doing was trying to feed poor kids on the block. He, all he was doing was trying to feed poor kids. And they didn't like that. And so they took him out and they killed him. Okay? So now you've got people all over Latin America with those stories. And I'm starting to read these stories. And I'm realizing that me, the guy who before could stand up and, you know, with the, with the, hang on, with the national anthem, right, and look at the flag, I can't do that anymore. I stand and I'm respectful, but I also know that that flag represents the same thing that killed these women. And not just these women. How many more do you want? How many thousands of people? So how many people do I know in my family? I come from a long line of people in the military. I work with the military. I've been a consultant for the military. I'm really involved at multiple levels. And yet I got to stand up with the flag. And imagine how difficult that is for me, starting when I was 20 years old. And if you, if, 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 if you think like, wow, what's the problem with that? Or you should do that then what I want you to do is come see me after class and I will introduce you to somebody whose father was killed because their father stood up for something that people in the U.S. government didn't like. And so then they paid someone to go kill them. You see, you see what I mean? You see the, the complexity here? The problem? And if you don't understand that, then and you, if you have a hard time believing that, then you're just like I was when I was 20 years old. Because when I was 20 years old, I couldn't believe it. I had to keep reading and reading more. Like, come on, that's not the government. That's not the United States. Like, we don't do that. That's not what we are. Come on. It's not. Or it became like, well, that's just what happens in war. But hang on. No, it's not what happens in war. Four nuns don't get pulled out of their car, brutally raped, and then killed. And then we know who did it, and the United States refuses to even begin to prosecute them. Why? Because we trained them in the United States. We taught them to do it. We paid them to do it. And it's not just four nuns. It's one person after another after another and thousands upon thousands of people. And you think, what did they possibly do? What did they do? And so you can imagine Sam, the 20-year-old, who's got to now put all this stuff in his head to figure out, how do I make sense of this? Because that's not the country I know. When I was 20, you know, my brother had already been four years in the military. My nephew was already five, four years in the military. I was, you know, it's like this thing. Like, what do I do? How do I sit with this? What makes sense? So then I start going back, and I realize I start reading the history 
of Latin America. And I realized, my God, this is just, these are just big farms. And the United States, basically, once we took control of Latin America, kicked the Spanish out, basically what we did was just pour a lot of money into the rich elites in Latin America and gave them enough weapons so they could control the people so that all the the produce and what they were exporting, we could just make decisions about what to do with that. So we just allied ourselves with the elites, and then we had all this, bananas and pineapples and tobacco and whatever it is that we need. And then we align with them, and then that's just us. And the more I read, the more I realize, oh my gosh, this is like, we. there was this word where we called about the banana republics. These were just like, you know, they're, they're some countries, but this is just the United Fruit Company's Caribbean Empire. One. This is the United States. We basically went into the countries and said, hey, they're ours now. And now we need a military there, so what we'll do is we're going to use, take the rich, and we're going to pay them off, and then they're going to establish the military, and they'll do our dirty work, and we'll give them all the weapons they need, and then we'll get all of the fruits of their labor. And then it gets more and more intense and more and more complex. And eventually, you get to a place where people in Latin America are suffering so much that they start to rise up. And there's a whole movement in the 1960s around the world that was sort of coalesced around this idea of communism and socialism. So people, poor people, like really poor people, y'all, like if you can, like essentially slaves, so you got it? Like imagine. And they start to suddenly rise up a little bit and to come together. You know, like you all get together and you say, hey, we're going to, we got to figure out how we're going to even feed our children here. We're going to start a school and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And then the, the com- countries here start to establish these death squads. And the death squads are all these secret squads. The first off, they have their militaries, but the militaries can't do it all. So then they have all these secret squads. And the secret squads are just watching for the communists, watching for anybody who wants to actually do anything to help their people. And y'all, like, look, one of the problems in life that many of you probably have right now is, is this doesn't matter to you. It, it doesn't matter because it's not real. It's not real, right? You know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't. It's not real till you sit down with someone whose husband was pulled out of their house or who lost their child or one thing after another after another. It's not real. And at that moment, things start to change because then the person is a real face. You know what I mean? And then you got to confront all of the issues. So here. So here at Death Squad, this is, the, these are, this is El Salvador. This is in Guatemala. Right? So here are some of these squadrons. Squadrones de muerto. And here's some of the stuff, the dirty work they did. Executing people, dumping bodies in mass graves, decapitating people, crucifixion. All the most horrific, innocent people. Priests and nuns and the like, good people. Christian ministers, doesn't matter. Good people, nice people, right? All this stuff. Hey, by the way, if you are following the Middle East, I, did, I used to do a lecture on this, I don't anymore, but if you're following the Middle East at all, if you're familiar with ISIS in the, in the Islamic State, are, you, are, you, are some of you familiar? Those are the exact same things that ISIS is doing in Syria and in Iraq. So these horrific, horrible, terrible people, subhuman people who claim to be, we call them subhuman, who claim to be Muslims. Who are doing these terrible things. They're do- this is all they're doing. And this is all these other people doing who we actually paid to do. We trained them. They're part of the United States, part of our tactic. And this isn't a way of just hating the United States. It's a way of understanding what's going on. This is like, this is serious. So imagine me, I'm 20 years old. Then I'm 21 and I'm 22 and I'm studying this more and I'm getting more just crazy because it makes no sense to me because I'm just this kid from Toledo, Ohio. 
I'm working class. I'm going to the University of Toledo. It's a small state school. I'm paying $500 a quarter to go to school. By now studying sociology, I, I didn't know anything. I was just every day trying to pull my head out of my rear end, just going like, but yet I keep confronting these things that are throwing me into this whirlwind of reality. And then I start to encounter stuff. So here are some victims in El, from in San Salvador in 1981, right? So this is all stuff now I'm engaging in. Like I'm really, it's just death squads trained by the United States, often in the United States, using weapons paid for by the United States. So imagine me. My mind's just spinning like, what the fuck? What? Right? Seriously? And so somehow I got to hold these two together. Because the United States isn't, this isn't the United States I know, which is also true. Right? The truth. It's the place we, we send people out to help people. We send people out when there's famine. We send people out to do all sorts of really awesome things. Most often we use our military to do good things. It's like, come on, we're doing this. Not, not the people, not the Americans I know, but this secret shit's happening. And I got to make sense of it. So here are some people who've been killed. I mean, I, it, it's like the, the body. I can't even begin, you know, tens, of, hundreds of thousands of people. Here's the Guatemalan armies. The, you know, it acknowledged destroying 440 Mayan villages in two years. 440 Mayan villages. This is a military trained by the United States. So essentially going into these villages because they have the idea that these are communists there. And we got to get rid of the communists because that's jeopardizing the United States and everything we stand for. So imagine just going in, surrounding the villages, burning them, and then slaughtering people. 440 is what they acknowledge. Men, women, children, elderly, slaughtered with weapons paid for by the United States, by people trained by the United States. So imagine now, now I'm like 20 here, 20, 23 in 1983, I was 23, I was born in 1960. Here's a mass grave of 50 Salvadoran compass in, 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 in Chalatenango. And this was killed by this battalion here that was trained at School of the Americas. That's in Fort Benning, Georgia, right? So look at, it's just one after another. You keep going. Look at, look at all the bones. This is mass graves upon mass graves. Hundreds of thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands. Right? Okay, so here we go. Look at, this is so intense, man. So this is the person who's doing the excavation. And look at how the two people are holding each other. Imagine that's your mother and your father. And they did nothing. They weren't a threat to the government. They did nothing. In a foreign country, a foreign invading country, paid to have them killed. Imagine that. So this is the legacy that we're working with all the time. And so, you know, you don't know about it. But imagine those of you who like, you know, you just kind of follow, you have this idea like, you yeah, know, Trump, go Trump or conservatives or I love America and who are pissed because I said, I have a hard time standing. I can't really salute the flag. I stand out of respect. But in my mind, our image is like this with people who I talk to, people's stories. I know the stories firsthand. I've been to places like this. Like, how do you do that? How would you do that? That's like somebody coming and killing your family and then someone saying, oh, but you have to go and say hi to them. You got to go say hi to them. But, but they just killed my whole family. Oh, well, that doesn't matter. I mean, I know that, but you still got to, you got to be respectful. You can't call them out. You can't scream at them in a courthouse. It's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Like, seriously, this, this, is, this, is, this is a shit that I live with. Why, well, I'm half nuts. 
So here, here's one. Look at these are all Mayan women. This is in they're they're in a small village in Guatemala, and they're holding photos of people who the, the military killed with U.S. weapons, with support from the U.S. Right, dudes. You know, you know what I mean? Like, you, 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 know, do, do you don't want to go through life being stupid. You don't want to go through life being ignorant. Trust me, because I go through life being stupid and ignorant. And you don't want to do that. You, want to, you don't want to say dumb, like, the United States is the greatest country in the world. If you know nothing about this, you got to at least know this. And then if you know this, you'd never have to say that kind of thing. Because you'd be smart enough to not say stupid stuff like that. Like, just stuff like, oh, we're the greatest country. It's like, oh, God, come on, man. You haven't even, vi- how many countries have you visited? What do you know? What do you know about U.S.? What do you know about us? We're not the worst country. We do amazing things, including with our military. We do amazing, amazing, cool, awesome things. But, man, you've got to confront that. You gotta, you gotta sit with that somehow. This is also part of the story. So when I can say, I can say, for example, you know, there's a way in which the U.S. is the most awesome country in the world. Not a question. And I think that. I truly believe that. And then I'm going to describe awesome to you. But I'm going to describe awesome. I'm going to define it differently than you might define it. But, but I think that the U.S. is really probably the most awesome country in the world. I don't mean the biggest, the most powerful, and all that bullshit. I mean like an amazing place where people get along and do amazing things, and it's awesome. But like, you gotta, you, you gotta be part of it. You gotta see this, bro. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with having pride in your country. Like, yeah. I've been to many countries, and I have to say, like, America gives opportunities to like my family that they couldn't yeah. get in their country. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's sad what happened, but I have nothing to do with this. Like, I, I mean, yeah, I got you. I don't know. I no. st- I do think America is a great country. Yeah, you know personally. that's cool, dude. No, America is a great country. I got it, and it's cool to have pride in a country. That's cool. But you, but if you're gonna really have that pride. I'm just going to say, for you, if you're going to say that to me in my face, then I'm going to say, that's cool to have the pride. And do you know about this? If your pride includes all these other things, then we're good with that, right? Then I'm, I'm, it's cool. But you got to sit with the struggle because nothing is black and white in this world. So you got to sit with the struggle. That's what makes us thinkers. That's like what you want to be. That's why we're in college, is to be thinkers. We're in college. You're here... Because those of you who don't think about this stuff, you're here right now because you need to think about this. You need to think about the fact that those two people right there who died holding each other, so that means they were alive when they were killed. And it's certain they were poor, innocent people who didn't do anything. You got to also make that part of your story. That's why you're here today. What's, how do you include that? So when you say there's nothing wrong with being proud of your country, that's cool, got it. America's an amazing place, yes. America gives opportunities to people, yes. Not a question, not only here, but also in other countries, right? And we're also that. So you got to include that. How do you do I know, I can do it. I've, I've sat, L- listen, y'all, I've sat with parents, with parents who lost their children to death squads, okay? I've had them tell me right in my face the pain. I saw the the photos of their children. My government, my tax dollars, everything, right? So I'm there, I got, and yet I can still say exactly what you just said, which is like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with people having pride in their country, and there's nothing, but that's also sitting on my shoulder, going like, and, these other things are happening. So you got to live in both worlds. You want to live in both worlds. Right? You know what I mean? Because right, you, you want to live there. Because to, to live in one world is to live in the black or live in the white. And you want to be in the gray. That's why we're here, is to be in the gray. 
So when I'm standing at the at the at Rec Hall, and I, you know, and I'm I'm like, and with all these people, and I'm and I'm like, looking around, and some people have their hands on their hearts, and, and you know, I had my hat was off, and some people have their hands at their side, and some people aren't really looking at the flag. I'm looking at the flag, and I have an immense amount of respect for the flag, because I because I. I work with the military, not only in the U.S., but in NATO countries. I mean, this is what I do, right? I know people. I'm there. And so I'm standing with the flag going, whoa, just feeling these waves, waves, and just reminded of all the people who I met in my journey who have suffered because of us, just in Latin America. And I'm sitting with that. And let me tell you, my mind is just spinning in this, like doing this dance. Of like, yeah, okay, I got it. There's nothing good. There's nothing bad. It's just, it's the dance of living. And it's cool. But I'm alive because I'm wrestling. Damn. Here. Here's one. This guy, real smart, he was the kind of an evangelist type guy who was in the military and he fancied himself as a pastor. And he was the Guatemalan president. And Ronald Reagan was president. So here they are together, right? And he was just the, the worst. I mean, he was, you know, it's like 200,000 people died when he was, you know, like two years. And Reagan's saying he re- recognizes, uh, or this is his campaign advisor, he recognizes that a good deal of dirty work has to be done. Dirty work. Dirty, hang on, y'all. Hang on real fast. Dirty work. That's dirty work. So you imagine, right? Well, dirty work, it has to happen. Really? It has to happen? Okay, here you go. Ready? How about if we take a trip over and hey, you can have a conversation with ISIS? They're looking for people to behead. How about that? And go talk to them and see, that's dirty work. Is that all right? Like, what are we talking about here? I don't know why I gave that example, but I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So here it is. He's a man of great integrity and totally dedicated to democracy. So in 2013, he was found guilty of genocide. We knew. When Reagan said that here, when he's, when here, Reagan knew. We knew he was committing genocide. We knew that. But he was our guy. It's not genocide when it's the person that you support. So here he is. He was sentenced to 80 years in prison. Finally, we get a little bit of justice. It's like, okay, got it. It's crazy, right? But here's the deal. So these are some headlines that I just pulled up. Um, Death squads are back in Honduras. They're back in Honduras. Because Honduras is suffering economically, and people are starting to say, hey, wait a minute, this is a problem here, and we need to mobilize, and we need to feed our children, and we need to go to school, and we need safety, and we need hospitals, and we need this, and we need that. And Guatemala has used anti-drug resources for political monitoring. So we're giving them anti-drug resources, and they're using it to monitor dissidents. This is where the dissidents. The dissidents are people like the, the nuns and the priests who are just trying to mobilize. Those are the dissidents, the same people, same things happen. U.S. funded police linked to executions in El Salvador. Oh, we don't like what that person's doing over there because they're trying to mobilize some the trade unionists to get better paying jobs because people can't survive. Oh, well, we'll just start assassinating people. Got it? Are we there? So it's coming back. You see that? You see how it is? Now watch. Now watch what happens. Um, Hang on. No, hang on. Got to go back here. I got rid of this. Okay. Most of these people are from Guatemala and Honduras. And you say... Well, we're not responsible for them. Why should we let them into our country? Oh, really? Maybe it's not that simple. 
I was listening to an interview of a couple people from Guatemala who are on, who are probably in this very group right here. And they were talking about what led them to get onto this caravan and come to the United States. And it's the same stuff I was reading about when I was your age. And I'm thinking, whoa. And I think, and they're getting weapons from the United States. And they're still getting training from the United States. And their lives are in danger because, you know, one reason or another. And I think, here we are. Here we are. We're back. It's like my whole life has gone for full circle in, you know, 35 to 40 years, right? It's gone full circle. It's like, God. And so I can't look at these people and say, I mean, I'm like, well, you can't just open the borders and let everybody in, right? You can't just do that. And yet, what? What? You know what I mean? It's like, God. So here. Let me go back. Now let me show you something else. You know what 300 billion is? That's how many proven, how many... 300 billion barrels of oil. Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. It's about 35 billion barrels more than what we know Saudi Arabia has. Okay? Think about the history of the United States and the history of us wanting to control Latin America. And here's the oil reserve. The oil fields are right here. They sort of go right this way. Okay? Now, it makes you imagine that oil isn't part of this whole thing. Maduro's a dictator. Chavez was a dictator. All these things that are happening, and we need to go, and we need to liberate Venezuelans from what? From what? Their dictators? Or from the control of their oil? We spent, what did we spend in, what are the, the wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan? What, like trillion and a half dollars or something? So we don't have to go over there. We could just go right here. So it's just kind of curious to think, wow, we just go around the world. The oil is our oil. Like we were in the Middle East to take somebody else's oil. That's why we invaded Iraq fundamentally because they had oil and we wanted to control it so we're going to go like we're going to go take your oil imagine bro like we just show up at your house one day and we're like we're going to take this apple tree right here well we'll leave you the tree but we'll take all the apples out of it because we want that and you're going to say oh yeah okay fine and then over here she's saying like well they have a right to take your apples we need the apples like our people need those apples right so we should get your apples and like well because we need them So when you think about going to Iraq to take oil, and you think, well, but we need the oil, it's the same damn thing as of the two of us taking his apples and us thinking we need them and that we deserve them. Or maybe now it's going to Venezuela and taking oil because we need that. You see what I mean? So like, well, maybe oil's part of this. God, it's a lot of things, obviously. If you study Venezuela, it's immensely complicated. Here's the biggest thing right here. Here's Chavez. Chavez was elected, and you know you see the economy is doing okay. Then it tanks, and then it's doing quite well. Actually, that's an immense amount of growth. And the price of oil was pretty high, so everything is good. And then oil starts to tank, and then boom. And that's all you need to know for Maduro. That's why he's not going to last very long. He'll be gone very soon. And everybody, you know, you got a couple billion or a couple million, what three million? I think Venezuelans have left now in the past several years. And it's like getting out if they can get out and if you can't get out because if you have land, if you have houses, if you have whatever, right? As you know, right? And so like, here we go. Look at that. That's why it's not going to last. That's also part of it. It's a complex thing. Yeah, I'll leave that there. You know, dudes, 
there's nothing in an hour. There's no way that I could even begin to offer up a vision in one hour. It most, it most. I could just put a question mark in our heads about what we know and what we think we know. You know, I was um, in Nicaragua when I was 26. I tell this story sometimes because it's a really intense story. For me, it was one of those pivotal moments. And I was walking. I got a... Uh, I was coming in from Costa Rica, and I was delivering some medicines to a Guatemalan, a refugee community that was living in Nicaragua. And I had met some Guatemalan refugees, and they asked me if I would, I would, they knew I was going down and I'd be close enough, you know, a couple hundred miles away. And they say, hey, could you go, do you feel like going to Nicaragua and delivering this? And I say, yeah, I'll do that. So I went to the border and then I started hitchhiking because I had to get to, there's a huge, I have such an amazing story about that. But I caught a ride with the guy. So if you're from Pittsburgh, this will be interesting to you. The guy who was drafted who was best friends with Roberto Clemente, and he was drafted with him and then played in the Pirates farm system with Roberto Clemente. And then Clemente went on to be who he is. And if you follow baseball, you know who that is. And this guy didn't. But this guy gave me a lift. So we had all these really awesome stories, and he showed me these photos. I mean, it was really cool, right, just to have that. But anyway, so I showed up in this little town in the middle of the afternoon. And there was a civil war going on in Nicaragua at the time. This was in the mid-'80s. And, uh, and the Americans were funding one side of the war and fighting against, you know, the other side, right, which was the socialist government of Nicaragua at the time. And we were trying to unseat the government. And so I'm walking down this road, and there's an old woman sitting on her porch. It was this house. It was wood and with the corrugated aluminum roof. And, and I'm walking by like this, and she says, hey, oye, gringo. And I said, I stopped. And she said, oye, gringo, donde vas? And I said, uh, I don't know. I'm just going down. She said, ven acá. So she says, where are you going? And I said, I don't know, say. I'm just walking. And she said, well, come here. So I sat down with her. And I, she was sitting in this chair, and I sat on her steps. And she started talking about her life. And her whole front part of her house had been, was gone. And I said, what happened to your house? And she said, well, the war came in and they shot a tank. A tank shot a, a shell and just blew off that part of my house. But, you know. So we started talking about the U.S. And, and she said to me, you know, and it's kind of funny. When you get to be like the, my age, you're, you know, one of the cool things about growing old is you get to look back and see to see those moments in your life that changed you forever. So this woman says, listen, gringo, you see what this is. You see what's going on here. When you go back to your country, because I told her I was going to be a teacher, you know, I was teaching. Do something for me. Always tell your students about what is going on in other parts of the world so that they know. And tell them what has happened here in my country. And it's funny because I never get her. She's always in my mind. And then since her, that moment that I made a commitment to her, I promised her that I would do that. And so I always talk about international issues. I've met many other people, many other stories. And the stories are just as profoundly sometimes disturbing and sometimes uplifting because some of it is just absolutely amazing and awesome and some of it's really disturbing.
And I never forget how I used to be the person who didn't know any of this. And then I just accepted life for what it was until that one day when my world started to turn upside down and then it all started to change. And by the way, you can love your country and you can love other countries at the same time. And you can love your country and you can also understand and criticize things that your country has done and is doing. So, for example, Saudi students. You're in this right now. Big time. Chinese students. You're in this big time. Because I could talk about China and some things happening there. And I can talk about the Saudis and what's happening in Yemen, in the Emiratis, in Qataris. We could go on and on. It doesn't matter. It's everybody. But what makes us human is the ability to see the two, see both, and just accept that. That's okay. And those of you who think like, oh, the United States is the worst country in the world, nah, man, no, 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 no. For all the shit that I've seen, trust me, I've seen other countries who all, who've done the same thing and sometimes much, much worse. And it's hard to get much worse than some of the stuff I've seen that we've been part of. But it is. So you can't do that either. So those of you who are leftists, don't like just play that card. Because that's just ignorant, man. That's just like, come on, man. Don't play that card. You want to play the card of knowing and understanding. And then withholding some opinions before you really get it. Um, so who's got a couple questions we have 10 minutes and I, I want to take a couple questions I, I would take actually I would rather take kind of some thoughtful questions bro yeah my question is uh, don't you think that like the blame for what we talked about today lies infinitely more with the Central American governments that directed and perpetuated these atrocities than with the United States government who is simply outfitting other countries yeah. to win them over to our side instead of the Soviets who would have easily so, supplied that funding instead of us. Yeah. So here's how I would say, here's what I would say about that. Money is like, this a re dude, thanks for asking that question. That's a really cool question. And I actually have a really cool answer that I've never had before. So <laughs> I finally, you give me a chance to say something that's actually thoughtful for once. Uh, money is like a drug. Power is like a drug. And you've you got to understand the nature of elites in Latin America for 400 years. You've got you to you you understand how powerful and rich people were and have been and continue to be, right? You've you got you to just hold that. And so m money, it's like a drug, and so when we go down and we say, hey, we need this, 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 and this, and then we go to some elites and we say, hey, we're going to give you all of these things, but you've got to give us X, Y, and Z in return. It's no different than you going to an, I don't know, like an AA meeting or something, you know what I mean? With a bottle of alcohol and just saying, like, hey, I got this really nice alcohol, like, you know, $500 bottle of whiskey. And just going to the meeting and being like, hey, you want to have some of this whiskey? And eventually, if they drink it, it's their fault, right? They did it. They made the choice. But you're also, you know, come on, you know, man, they're going to do it. They're going to take it. Someone's going to drink that alcohol. And probably if it's expensive enough, they're all going to drink it. So that's, it's that. That's how it is, right? So it's like I can get, yeah, so it's, both are responsible. There's, not, there's no question at all, right? Both are responsible. But the issue is I'm here in the U.S. I'm going to, and I'm, you know, when I'm standing in rec hall looking at the flag, I got to deal with that flag and I got to deal with me. And pretty soon I'm going to get, get a, you know, my taxes back from my accountant and I'm going to write a check to Uncle Sam, right? And like, 
there it is. So here we go. This is me. And some of that money is going to go here. And so that's why, I, that's why I talk about this. I could talk about Colombia. I could talk about Maduro in, in, in Venezuela. I could tell you all the shit that that... And, or, you know, so, that's, so it's a really cool question. And yes, you are, you are correct. And the two things go together. Yeah. Uh, Dude, my, cool my question is... Uh, so we talked about... Wait, where are you? Oh, dude. All right, bro. Oh, so, dude. Jonathan. What's up? So basically, so we talked about all the messed up stuff that's going around the world. and Yeah, me, but it's not all, right? You, yeah, you need to understand. Yeah, the yeah. vast majority of act actions in the world are not messed up. They're actually really cool. The world's not getting more violent. The world's not getting more messed up. Uh, People, yep. yeah, I'll keep yeah, that in I mind, underst everybody. I understand okay. those points. And like... Uh, uh, but like f from this perspective, one thing that uh, I think we should talk about is like how are we going to change this? How, how can we solve this kind of problem that we see? It's not, the question is not as direct as that, yeah. but uh, I, I think that thinking about the solution would be important okay. so, uh, so we're not going to see uh, dead bodies everywhere. So for me, it's, it's what, what comes down to the foreign policy of the United States. What kind of foreign policy can, should we follow? And if yeah. so, should we care about our values and morals and all, that, all this stuff? Because it comes down to, you know, interest. There's, okay. a, there's a national interest embedded in, by, by uh, the country's leaders. Okay. Like, Here, let me, let me respond. Let me give you a response. First off, I'm not concerned about U.S. foreign policy. Like, I, I, I don't have an impact on U.S. foreign policy. I'm not. It, that, that, that has nothing for me. I can't, you know, I'm closer to it than a lot of you all, right? Like, I, you know, my, one of my former, st I mean, I, I have people, former students, people are working. I mean, I'm closer to it than a lot of people. But I'm not interested in that. All I'm interested in is each one of us becoming a better person today than we were yesterday. And I think becoming a better person is also having more awareness, being smarter and being more thoughtful. And like, I can like Trump. Dude, you think Hillary, you think Trump's worse than those, the Democrats in here? You think Trump's worse than Hillary Clinton? You think what Trump is, his policies in Venezuela and Latin America and whatever are, are worse than what Hillary Clinton's policies would be? Are you, are you kidding me? So you can't, none of that you can do. All I'm concerned about is each one of us just being a better person than we were. Being more thoughtful, being smarter, being more just kind. You know, so when you see, look, you, you go back to this right here, this photo, right there. There. That photo. When you see that photo, I don't want, don't be a bleeding heart liberal. You don't, you don't want to be like, oh, these poor people, oh, they're suffering so much. Oh, gosh, that's so terrible. Now let me go just to have a beer or whatever because it's State Patty's Day or whatever it is. It's like, no, that's not the answer. The answer is look at them, under, think about the complexity of what's going on here, and then make your, our lives more complex. You, you know what I mean? So that like, yeah. I all, all make our lives more complex and just then be better person people because we're just more thoughtful. That's it. There's no answer to that. You don't let them in. You don't hold them out. You don't do it. I don't have, I don't have an answer. I just want to be thoughtful and I want you to be more thoughtful. And I don't, you know, I don't want you to say dumb, saying dumb things like Hillary wouldn't have done that. Please come on, man. Or we're the greatest country in the world. You know, just no. Just come on. That's just not it. Nor are we the worst country. That's also really dumb. It's like, please. It's all just like, ugh. Yes, and you, and you know, like, oh, my God. Anybody else? Anyone else have a final question? Who's got another question? Bro, I'm right here, man. Okay, so uh, basically, to me, your argument earlier was almost like um, blaming Remington for the supply and production yeah. of uh, blaming Remington for the supply and production of um, like guns that were used in like say a school shooting or to kill somebody. Yeah. Um, basically, at the end of the day, I don't think that we get to pick and choose how people use the resources and supplies we give them. And on top of that, who's to say like this is horrible? I I agree with you. Yeah, it's yeah, horrible. Yeah. 
But at the end of the day, like, who's to say that our, like, the United States intervening in that area didn't stop another, like, socialist or communist country from intervening and overtaking that? Yeah, but that, who's to say it would be a good thing? When, when the Sandinistas took over um, Nicaragua, or when, you know, when Fidel Castro took over Cuba, do you have to know what Cuba was like before Castro took it over, right? So that's not inherently a problem. So th the issue is this. Wait, you should, wait, hang on one second. I want to respond to this. This is actually a really cool question. So it's not, it's not that we, we gave them weapons and then they made choices about how to use those weapons. No, no, no. We taught them how to use the weapons against their own people. We right. trained these death squads. We trained the death squads in how to kill. Yeah, but say we didn't we didn't know that they were going to use them for no that. but we did oh we did we did we did no we did using... that's okay. the thing okay so I didn't we knew know exactly that. yeah okay i got you. hey y'all that's a really good question thanks man hey y'all um wait hang on well we, i have one minute left i just want to say one final thing i have one minute on my watch dogs come on look i'm, I'm gonna say what i already said i'm gonna say it one more time I, I don't expect any of us to go out and start studying these things. That's not what it is. But what I want you to do is just remember that maybe you don't know. You know, maybe you don't have a whole story. That's it. Just like, that's how I walk through life. All right, see you all.